At that time, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene cometh early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and she saw the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Words taken from the gospel for this a Saturday in Easter octave. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our blessed Lord rose on the morning of the first day of the week, just before dawn. It was still dark, and he was out of the tomb. The Psalms speak of this as our Lord arousing the dawn. I will rise up early, it says in the Psalms. Psalm 56 and Psalm 107. This fact and many others that occurred on Easter Sunday, they symbolize something very mysterious about our Lord, namely what is called his absolute and universal primacy. This absolute primacy of Christ basically means this. When God contemplated creation, He wanted, first and foremost, to join himself to his created order in some way. Now, we know this to be the hypostatic union. In other words, he was going to unite something of creation to one of his divine persons, the second person. This he would do, as we know, in Christ. Christ is one person, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, the Word, but yet he has two natures a divine nature and a human nature, united in one person. This is called the hypostatic union. He did this because such a union with his creation would bring him, that is God, the most glory. And he would be perfectly known and perfectly loved in his created order. No matter what happens in this created order, he would always be perfectly known and perfectly loved. This is why he did it. One of the reasons. And this is why St. Paul tells us that Christ is the firstborn of all creatures. Or, another way of putting it, he's the firstborn of all creation. He's the first thought out of God's mind when it comes to the created order. Thus, we have a summary of this found in Scripture, mostly the Apocalypse, but also other places. Even in the Old Testament, we know that Christ is yesterday and today. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. All time belongs to him in all ages. To him be glory and dominion through every age forever. Amen. This is the year of our Lord, 2018. This is his year. All time, even before he was born, the Virgin Mary belongs to him. Thus, St. Peter says, Foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world. Listen to his words. Foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but manifested in the last times for you. He was born. He came. But he was foreknown. He was forewilled. It was decreed at the very beginning. So what is more, God would make all things through him and for him such that he would have the primacy in everything. Thus, we say he's the exemplar cause. He's the blueprint. He's the pattern. He's the summation of all creation. In order for Christ to come at the fullness of time, God then willed at the same time that he have a mother. Thus, the second born of all creation, we could say, using these words, is Our Lady. They were both willed by God before the angels, before men, and all the rest of creation. They were willed, as Pope Pius IX said in the decree on the Immaculate Conception, in one and the same decree. So as God willed the Christ, the hypostatic union, he willed his mother at the same time. Then came other decrees, angels, men, animals, plants, etc. This is captured, in a way, in the Sistine Chapel with Michelangelo's depiction of Adam's creation 
everybody knows the picture where God's right hand is just about ready to touch Adam's and Adam's sitting there lifeless and God's going to give him life. Go look at that picture. And around the left hand of God, as it were in his mind and in his thought are clinging a woman and a child. And then the angels are around them. That woman is our lady and the child is our Lord. You can think of it like that. They were in the mind of God. And so he's saying to Adam, I'm creating you, Adam, for him. I'm creating you, Adam, in view of him. I'm creating you to look like him. And from your side, I will make the woman, Eve. They were willed before Adam and his sin. And this is why they have no sin. They are without original or actual sin. They are immaculate. They were willed before Adam and his sin. And this is why our Lord and our lady had to come to our rescue. Because being without sin, they were the ones who could free us and save us from sin. This is sometimes called the dual primacy. So there's the universal and absolute primacy of Christ in the same decree as willed his mother. Dual primacy. Now, I'm bringing all this up for a reason, because Easter Sunday encapsulates these truths in a remarkable way. He rose before the dawn of the morning of the first day of the week, the first day of creation, before the light was made, before the light shone upon the world. Thus, David says in the Psalm 109, from the womb before the day star, I begot thee. Before the first day of creation, when the light first dawned on the world, God willed him. Since all things were somehow made through him, he had to be in the mind of God first, to be the blueprint, to be the exemplar. This truth is indicated by the time of his resurrection, early in the morning before the sun rose. It is saying, since man fell away from the first creation, God will recreate with Christ through whom all things were made in a very similar way. He's going to recapitulate all of creation in Christ and make it right. Thus, we sing of him in the as the morning star in the exultet on the Easter vigil. Next, consider that he rose without anyone around. There were no human witnesses except the saints tell us our lady saw it. And perhaps a lot of the fathers from limbo, but they were not united to their bodies. They were already dead. Among the living, only Our Lady witnessed his resurrection. All was done in a sort of hiddenness, just as things were done before the foundation of the world. This also shows that there's a deep mystery here. Now we can ask, what did he do next? He passed out of the tomb without opening it. Of course, that symbolizes the incarnation, how he came through the womb, the virginal womb, as he went out of the virginal tomb without anybody opening it. But he went first, as we know, or first to visit him was the Blessed Virgin immediately upon his resurrection. He saluted his mother. The saints tell us something like this. Peace be with you. Shedding tears of joy, the virgin knelt to adore him, kissing his hands and his feet, saying, O blessed wounds, which have caused me so much suffering. O what consolations he must have bestowed upon her. O what a meeting this must have been for them. Now here is a sign then of the fulfillment of Isaiah. Deep as the netherworld is the sign, as high as the sky. Our Lady's Prayer brought our Savior out of the sky, out of heaven, in our incarnation, and up from the netherworld on Easter morn. For she kept vigil the whole night, the whole day. Now, see how this first visit fits with the dual promise of Christ and Our Lady. She is part of the original decree. So not surprisingly, if Easter Sunday is going to mirror creation as God willed it, you're going to have Christ, his mother. What's going to happen next? Angels, right? After he visits her, then, oh, by the way, she's called the morning star as well. Stella Matutina. This is one reason why Saturday, by the way, belongs to Blessed Lady as well. 
She kept vigil on that day and she prayed. But then what happens? Angels came, huh? The next thing we hear about are these angels. They preceded the humans to the tomb. They came and they opened the tomb. After God willed the Christ and his mother, he then willed the angels. They're the light of the first day that God separates light from darkness. The angels came with the dawn of creation, made first and foremost to glorify God and to serve his body, the church, to serve Christ. They were made for him. Thus, at the dawn of the first day of the week, they came and rolled back the stone and the devils were cast down in defeat. We can think of the soldiers perhaps symbolizing that as being paralyzed by his resurrection. In any case, the Lord himself points out, Amen, amen, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Then there is coming, as we know, as we heard today, the women who left when it was dark but arrived when it, was, when it became light. So the women and the men come who were born in sin, symbolizing Adam and Eve. There was Mary Magdalene, Mary Salome, Peter, Mary and Salome, Peter, John, and the apostles, and the disciples on the road to Emmaus, with the paralyzed soldiers representing the unbelievers or those still in their sin. See how recreation parallels creation? How wonderful is the plan of God? We could also jump to the end of Easter Sunday, and at the light is fading on the world, what happens? Christ comes, and they can't believe it. And he has to say, look, it's me. This represents the second coming. All of creation is, as it were, summarized in this one day. It's called a fractal pattern. Little tiny microcosm of the big macrocosmos. But what does this mean for us? One, Easter shows us that first and foremost, all is for Christ. Everything. Is he first in our lives? Do we start our mornings with him? The first thought out of our minds ought to be for Christ. Do we start all our works for him? Clearly, this is why the church obliges us under pain of grave sin to start our week with him and attending mass on Sunday. Every week without exception is to start with Christ. Second of all, when we make Christ the center of our lives in every way possible, we are forced to include Our Lady. They are inseparable. We must be, therefore, devoted to her. Do we pray her rosary every day, as she so kindly requested at Fatima and at Lourdes? She is our mother. Do we love her? Have we consecrated ourselves and all that we have to her? Wherever she goes, she always brings our Lord with her. Give yourself to her immaculate heart and all will go well. Let us keep in mind as a way to remember these important truths that joy, as we've mentioned before, J-O-Y spells Jesus, others, and yourself. When we put our Lord first, and ourselves last, with others in between, Easter joy will be truly ours. Yes, Christ yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. All time belongs to him and all the ages. To him be glory and dominion through every age forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.